great. Today, our scripture reading comes from James chapter 2, and please bear with, I didn't mark it in my Bible. James chapter 2, verses 14 through, th- I should just read from up there. I look for it. Verses 14 through 17. And this is actually one of my favorite parts of Scripture because the book of James is essentially a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And so what we read here and what we'll go through today, it tells us a little bit more about the practical application of how to live out Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you'll just follow along with me, we will read James chapter 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear gracious Lord, Almighty God, what good is it to say we love you and yet do nothing in our life to show that? God, what good is it? God, our moms and mother figures in our lives have taught us how to love and care. But if we don't share that love with others, do we really reflect its impact? Holy Spirit, as we dig through this passage today and explore, Christ, your call in our hearts, let us look at ourselves and ask, how am I living a life of integrity? A life in which people can say, that person has faith. Cleansing Lord, help us as we explore this today, consider and explore all the ways that we have kept ourselves from putting your faith in action and help us cleanse our hearts of those things so that we can create a world of peace. Cleansing Lord, fill us with your love today. Open our eyes so that we may see your love Open our hearts that we may hear your words. And most of all, Lord, may this not be my words that are heard today, but yours. And it may be not just our way that we follow, but yours. In your name we pray. Amen. As I've reminded us each week for the last several weeks, we've been going through a series on drawing a line in the sand. Taking our faith seriously and and not taking it for granted. Drawing that line and saying, God, I'm not going to back down. We use the first week an example of, of Thomas, the disciple, who when he questioned whether or not Jesus really did resurrect, I, I kind of got the feeling that it wasn't just doubting, it was also, if this is real, my entire life is going to change. And so he drew a line in the sand and he said, Jesus, if this really happened, let me see it. And then when he saw it, and when he believed it, he became the most aggressive disciple who went to the ends of the earth. He was the only disciple that went all the way to southern India. Everybody else stayed within the Mediterranean region. But he went the furthest because for him, his whole life had changed. You see, God calls us to take seriously this faith. Take seriously this commitment to a life of resurrection. To a life of renewal, of healing, of hope, of of health, of, of being men and women that bring grace, mercy, love, and God's resurrection to the broken in this world. God asks us to be serious To not just take it for granted because everybody else around us goes to church on Sundays. To make sure this is our real world. This is the defining factor in our lives. The one thing that we will not back down on. In doing that, the first thing we have to do is to choose to be alive. You see, the way of Christ is is the way of resurrection. It's the way of choosing new life, of letting go of the old ways, of the unhealth, of the brokenness, of seeking to overcome the baggage from our past so that we can then walk 
in life, in renewal, in resurrection. So that we can walk in a way that is Holy Spirit driven. That says, I am a new person. And so the, the first step in taking it seriously is choosing to deal with our own personal baggage. Choosing to deal with our past. Choosing to be alive. And next, as we do that, as we choose to be alive, we commit ourselves to the community of Christ because the community of Christ is where we can find the most strength to be alive. Which that also means, though, we have to commit ourselves to making sure the community of Christ is healthy, is doing what God asks, that we're not behaving in ways that are unchristlike, that we as the body of Christ are going out into the world and bringing his love, that we are committed to the ways of Christ, committed to sharing a community together, committed to loving and bearing one another's burdens, and committed to being authentic, to admitting, I made a mistake, I hurt you, to forgiving, to being honest. And to doing everything we can to clean any kind of toxicity that comes in to the community. Because you see, it is very true, and it is my 100% belief, that the body of Christ, this way of life, when we commit ourselves to following Christ and follow and commit ourselves to loving one another, this is the hope of the world. The world is seeking healthy relationships. God created us to love Him and to love one another and this is supposed to be the example of where to find it. And so when we commit ourselves to that way, commit ourselves to embracing healthy relationships, then we can move forward and we can bring hope to the rest of the world. In that, then we focus on doing everything we can to develop healthy relationships. We admit when we did wrong. We agree to disagree sometimes. We, we work ourselves through to forgiveness, to hope. And we decide that the relationship is more important. That the relationship is what we focus on over me being right, or you being right, or us being right. That we decide the way of Christ. Being in relationship with you, with each other, is more important than selfish love. This week, we come to the point of integrity. To, to the week in which we ask ourselves, okay, if we are putting a, pri if we are putting a priority on, on, on committing ourselves to taking this seriously, to drawing a line in the sand and saying, those who are ready to commit wholeheartedly to the faith, then we will stand on this side. But those who are not, choose to stay over there. And when we commit ourselves to that, to being alive, to the community of Christ, to building healthy relationships, then there are aspects of our lives and of our work life, of our daily interactions that must become a critical reflection of Christ. That in our daily reflections, we are living lives as men and women of integrity. You see, Marshall, let's go ahead. We're going to sit in this passage for a while. And we're actually, there's more around this in the book of James. We're going to deal with it as well next week. The rest of the stuff around these verses here. But like I said um, earlier, the book of James is, is a book that's essentially a commentary to the Sermon on the Mount. It, it's talking to, it's, it's this, we are assuming a guy named James who wrote to a bunch of, of men and women who they believe were, were uh, probably uh, former Jewish followers, Jewish people who had decided to follow in the way of Christ. And he was saying, okay, here's how it works. You are to be men and women of integrity. Men and women who when you say what you believe, you say that you believe this, then everything about your life reflects it. That we are to be men and women who live out the implications of what we believe. You see, we, we say this belief statement every Sunday. Not the same one, but essentially we say the Apostles' Creed. And if you really take seriously everything that is in that belief statement, then it will change your life. If we say we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, then it impacts the way that we're going to treat the earth. Because if we believe in God and we follow Him in love, 
then we don't want to destroy his creation, do we? No, we want to take care of it. So we seek to protect it. This week I, I had the wonderful pleasure of of engaging with my father and mother and my aunt and uncle and we toured around to all the places that um, they had grown up in and, and I have for the life of me since I've been here tried to be looking tried to find um, the farm that my great grandfather had out by Tangier well I wasn't alive when he had it so I had no idea where it was I just drove around aimlessly in the countryside looked a little weird I know but we managed to find it um, because I had somebody with me who knew it. And so my mom, my, my mom and dad and aunt and uncle and my cousin, Jack Williams, we all went out to the farm. And it was great. It was great to see the, how, the old farmhouse was gone, and, and, but some of the old buildings were still there, and, and all the trees were around there. And as my father and my uncle and, and my cousin Jack began to tell stories about growing up there as a child, my uncle says, you know, uh, Grandpa Williams, Granddad Williams would never let us climb the trees. I was like, why wouldn't he let you climb the trees? I mean, they're these big, beautiful, gorgeous trees. He said, because, because Granddad Williams knew it would disturb the nests of the birds, and he needed the birds because the particular birds that were up in those trees were birds that ate the insects that could potentially kill some of the plants. And he said, we're not going to disturb the ecosystem that's out here. Because we take from the land what we're supposed to take, but we don't destroy anything else. My, I didn't know the man, but the guy was, in a sense, one of the early environmentalists. He believed strongly that we live in a balance, and so we must take care of it because God gave him the earth to work, and he must protect the ecosystem that was there. If we go through our continued belief statements, when we ask ourselves, when we take seriously what we say we believe, there are actions that are implied from that. So Granddad Williams, he taught me that even though I didn't know him. He taught me that through my uncle. But when we take these things seriously, as it says here, you see, right before this, James says, you know, you can say you believe all these things, but then if you don't act them out, it's like looking in a mirror and then putting the mirror down and forgetting what you look like. That, that we have to realize we are a reflection of Christ into the world. And if we do not reflect God through our actions and our deeds, then there's every reason for people to choose not to believe in God. I've heard the phrase before that, that what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable is when Christians confess God with their mouth but then deny Him by their lifestyle. And so that's what we need to consider. We need to consider how are we going to make it a point to not dismiss somebody, but care for them. To make sure that our beliefs, the things we commit ourselves to, move forward. Now, I will say that several of us out there might say, well, now this, is, this whole world is just outrageously selfish. There's, it's, just, it's worse than it's ever been. There's so many people out there that, that don't live by integrity, that aren't authentic, that aren't, aren't honest anymore. But in reality, I want to challenge that because I think that's happened throughout history, throughout time. The problem is that this time we just have this instantaneous ability to learn about somebody's shortcomings, their selfishness, their mistakes. Nearly, if you look at history, nearly every dictator, every, every conqueror, every, every group of people that sought to destroy another person that did any kind of progress across the world, that, that, that there were many ways in which they were just as selfish, just as, as lack of integrity as we are today. I watched a, a, a quick little um, History Channel documentary on Attila the Hun. Uh, Attila the Hun. What a great name. Who would name their kid Attila? Not now, anybody, at least. But Attila the Hun, he just wanted to conquer. He didn't care if it was good or bad. He just went out and killed people. That was back in the first couple of centuries. There's people like that today. And so the difference is, in my opinion, 
that we just happen to know more about it today. We hear it more because we can get it instantaneously on our phones, on our laptops. And so what I want to challenge us to do as we continue through this message this morning is to consider the ways that we can fight back against these moments of, of lack of integrity, against these, these, these places, these people out in the world who seem to focus on selfish gain, who focus on getting more profit, more, more self, more things, more material goods, more whatever for themselves, that we contrast that by making sure we are selfless people. That we are men and women who are out there doing good, doing honest, loving, Christ-like things. You see, later on, after this section of the passage that we're reading today, uh, James challenges the, the men and women in his church that, that are, are rich and, and wealthy people because they are proclaiming they love God. And they're like, oh great, I got this little thing in my hat too. Another one of those. And yet, everything about their life is centering on their own gain and they are not paying attention to the poor, to the broken, to the, the ones that are in need. He says in there, woe to the wealthy people is what he talks about. He tells them, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. What horrible words to say to somebody, but he was mad at them. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay your workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. He calls out to him and says, you have hoarded and called forth and decided you want to gain everything you can for yourself. And the people who work for you are struggling to make ends meet. And so if we are truly crying out to be, calling ourselves to be men and women of Christ, then we are men and women of integrity who make sure to put others first, who see humanity for the way God created it. You know, as the, the oil industry, as we all know, is beginning to struggle somewhat. And we know that companies are having to close their doors left and right. But I recently heard the story of one company who one of the upper ex executives realized that if he didn't take a pay cut, he was going to lose all of his employees. And because he knew those employees needed to still make ends meet. He chose to cut his salary by a dramatic amount to make sure there was enough money left in the budget so that he could pay the salary of his foreman and other guys and gals who worked for him. You see, he realized his workers were more important than his own wealth. That is what it means to be a man or woman of integrity. And as I've said, the, the, the message is, or James is essentially a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And, and if we take a, just a quick glance to the Sermon on the Mount, we'll find essentially four, four or five things in there that, that tell us clearly what it means to be a man and woman of honest integrity who follow Christ. The first as we look through the reflection of, of the way the, the Beatitudes talk about other, others and, and the way that we are to, to treat others, we are, we are to look at humanity through God's eyes. So if we are truly taking seriously, walking in the way of Christ, then we are choosing to see humanity for the gift that it is. But every single person out there should be treated with dignity, even, even if they're a person who has harmed us. That they should be treated with the love of God and the respect of their existence. And it's an interesting way to think about it. Because I'm sure several of, several of us are like, I don't want to think of my person I don't like as a human. I'd rather hate them. It's easier to do that. But if we're following in the way of Christ and we're doing what the Sermon on the Mount says, we are learning to love our enemies and we're learning to look at humanity through the Lord's eyes. To look at other people and say, I realize that they may be poor in spirit. I realize that, that they may be mourning. 
I see them for who they are. I look at them and say, there might have been other circumstances in their lives that triggered this or that or this. But no matter what, we see humanity for what it is. And we ensure dignity to every single man and woman we come across. I heard a story once about how a young man saw a homeless man on the street and he decided he wanted to help him. And this was some guy in his 20s that was offering to an older gentleman who was homeless. He said, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And the man stuck out his hand and he said, just shake my hand and treat me with the dignity of a man. The 20-year-old was stunned because he thought, I have all this money here, I'm going to give this to you. And what really that, young, that older man needed was to be seen as human. To be seen as valuable and a contributor to society. Christ calls us to treat humanity with that kind of love. To look at our enemies and say, glory be to God because you are created. You are a human. I don't agree with your actions. I don't agree with everything you've done. But you are loved by God and because you are loved by God, I will learn to care for you. And I will learn to draw my boundaries. There are times we need to draw boundaries around people. But I will not treat you with hatred disrespect or degradation because that's not the way of God and that's probably the most challenging component of following the way of Christ because for us as humans it's much easier to say I don't like you than to say I'm going to learn to look at you through the eyes of Christ so that's actually one and two treat humanity like Christ would and love our enemies the next one, it talks about in there about how God wants us to make sure that our no means no and our yes means yes. You don't just make an oath and say, oh sure, I'll do that, and then you never intended on doing it. It makes it very clear. Your no means no, your yes means yes, and you treat people as you would want to be treated. Anybody who has ever gone back on a contract or a commitment or a statement to somebody that says, I will do this, and then chooses to deceive is breaking the law of Christ. Just make sure your no means no and your yes means yes. The next. Christ makes it clear. Build your life on the things that matter most. Put your treasure in heaven. For according to Christ, wherever our treasure is, there our heart will be also. He spends the second half of the Sermon on the Mount talking about this. About how we must put our treasure in Him. We must choose not to judge others because we understand it is God, the only one who judges. And and we are to put our soul in Him. And put Him as a priority and decide that He is greater than the ways of this world. That He is more important. That building our life on Him is the way that we want to exist. And that that is our true and complete commitment that we won't back down on it. Several months ago, I was in Oklahoma City um, and I was driving around downtown. It was right around 5 o'clock. It was was back when the sun was setting closer to 6 o'clock. And it was between 5.30 and 6 and you could tell the sun was starting to set. And as I'm driving through downtown and I'm stopped at a stoplight, I'm looking across the way, across the way, and there is an empty parking lot with a taxi cab parked in it. And I see a man outside of the cab and there's a rug in front of him. And he's kneeling. Now, no matter what we think about the Islamic faith, there are certain aspects, certain tenets in their practices that I feel like if we had that kind of commitment, whoa. (laughs) One of those is they commit to pray five times a day. They're required to pray 
in their faith format five times a day. But for many of us, we, we don't probably pray, but maybe once a day. But they pray five times a day. And this man, he was a black man, was kneeling and facing the way that in their faith they're told to face. They face towards Mecca. And he was watching for the sun to set because one of the prayer times is supposed to happen at sunset. And he was, he was on the clock. But he was committed in that moment in a town where we have to admit we're not super open always in, to other religions in this area. He was willing to stand up for his faith and take that moment to kneel. And to pray very publicly. And I'm sure as soon as that was done, he got up and he went on and continued about his day. I was stunned. Because I thought to myself, would I be willing to do that? Would I be willing to kneel at sunset every day and say the Lord's Prayer no matter where I was? Would I be willing to throw all else aside and put my treasure in heaven and say, Lord, I'm going to publicly commit to you so that everybody sees it. I felt a little shame because I didn't know if I would. What makes us Christ followers is our willingness to put aside all else and commit ourselves to the way of Christ and go beyond just proclaiming a belief and going into the action that goes with it. To going beyond belief and behaving in the way of Christ. Surrendering ourselves to the Holy One and letting His love live in us. A little further down in this passage, James talks about how Abraham was considered a friend of God because he was willing to demonstrate it in his life. We sang that song earlier because I know every single one of you wants to be a friend of God. The way we do that is live an integrity-filled life. Will you join with me as we do that? Amen.